Okay, now, as you may have heard, I'm looking for a new producer. Now, if I were to hire you, how would you help out my show? Well, the first thing I'd do is move production to Metabilis 3. Oh, they know how to produce an internet show. But I have my standards. If you're thinking of glorifying the dogs in any way, I'll walk. Uh, actually, I was just thinking of maybe getting better lighting. Oh, that's a good idea. I once defeated a rutan in a lighthouse by changing the polarity of the neutron flow and causing the bulb to blast the rutan with extreme heat. Intense heat, of course, being lethal to the rutans. Well, um, I have your resume. Please leave. Oh, very well. K-9, what have they done to you? Hey, get away from my Roomba! Master? I need a long vacation. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to Comic Book Issues. I'm your host, The Last Angry Geek. Well, it's a brand new day. Uh, scratch that. It's a new era. Norman Osborn's dark reign of Marvel Comics is over and the heroic age has begun. Along with the complete revamping of the Avengers titles, the end of Spider-Man's brand new day, hallelujah, and even a new era for Marvel's mutant race. With that in mind, let's see how the X-Men have evolved in this one-shot, Uncanny X-Men, The Heroic Age. This book can actually be seen as an epilogue or postscript to the recent X-Men crossover, Second Coming. When Hope, the mutant messiah, has returned from the future only to be confronted by an army of futuristic sentinels who want her dead. The X-Men protect her and the people of San Francisco, but not without heavy casualties including Nightcrawler, and boy did I get ripped for spoiling that death in my Magog review, and Hope's adoptive father, Cable. A major moment prior to Second Coming was one of the original X-Men beasts quitting the team in disgust of Cyclops' new, ruthless tactics. The Heroic Age one-shot follows three different mutants, Cyclops, Beast, and Hope, as they struggle to understand their place in this new, friendlier world. We open Cyclops' story with a flashback to the moment Beast quits the X-Men, spiraling out of Cyclops' decision to authorize a Black Ops mutant team in X-Force, and his own torture at the hands of Norman Osborn during the Dark Avengers Utopia crossover, the Beast no longer trusts Scott. Hearing from one of his oldest friends that he's gone too far in his quest to protect the remaining mutants clearly shakes Scott Summers, who tries to rationalize the Beast's leaving. We then jump to the present and find Scott in the Savage Land blowing up dinosaurs in an effort to center himself as he's now looking back at his decisions, trying to feel out whether he was right to cross the lines that he did. He's tracked down by Captain Steve Rogers, the former Captain America, and now the man in charge of policing superheroes. Rogers decides to help the mutant cause by making the X-Men heroes for their defense of San Francisco, in an effort to demolish the hatred and bigotry that's haunted mutants for years. Cyclops is awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom and becomes a public symbol of heroism. It's only at home, talking to Hope, that he realizes he's treated the so-called Messiah as a symbol rather than a person. Chucking his medal into the Pacific Ocean, he agrees that Hope should make her own decisions, and once again Cyclops decides he'll be the best leader he can be because it's what his people need of him. In the Beast story, Hank McCoy finds himself stood up for a date from his girlfriend. Walking around and feeling sorry for himself, he runs into one of the few non-X-Men affiliated mutants. Molly Hayes, Princess Powerful from The Runaways. Molly asks Hank to step into a mentor role and explain extinction to her. Molly turns the conversation around on him, saying that mutants aren't really extinct, but Hank counters that the few new mutant activations since the end of Second Coming aren't enough to save the species. When Molly counters that you have to have faith, Hank cynically alludes to that being something Nightcrawler would say, and that Kurt is now dead. Molly, blessed with super strength, decks McCoy and calls him a jerk. Molly, now upset and feeling insignificant, doesn't understand why her people must die off. The Beast counters with the same thing Captain America said to Cyclops. We're all just people now. But he assures her that mutants can still make an impact on the world and that people will never forget them. Having cheered Molly up, Hank also finds his spirits raised as he now understands feeling sorry for yourself is no reason to stop living. Finally, we have Hope's story. 
Having used her mutant powers for the first time, she finds herself on the other end of a full superpower examination from Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic of the Fantastic Four. I wonder why the team is named after Mr. Fantastic. But then the Invisible Four or the Human Torch Four or even the Thing Four just doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? Reed's son Franklin visits with Hope and he assures her that all the people who are telling her what to do, protecting her, and even expecting things from her will soon become her family. Mr. Fantastic's request for her family records brings her right back to her origins as the mutant baby who was the cause of the Cooperstown, Alaska massacre back in X-Men Messiah Complex. This unexpected questioning sets Hope on a new path, eventually tying into the Cyclops ending, where she requests to go to Alaska to find her family. So there you have it. Three mutants who were lost before and had no idea what to do with themselves are now refocused and rededicated. Cyclops and Hope's story will continue on in Uncanny X-Men while the Beast goes back to his other family as the newest member of the Secret Avengers. But what about this one-shot itself? Well, let's look at the art first. First off, there's a nice, if somewhat uninspired, cover by Mark Brooks. Mark is a fairly good artist and I like his style, but it's just some people standing in front of some larger, transparent people. A theme we've seen numerous time in X-Men comics, but rather than burst from the page, they're just standing there. Again, nice, but nothing special. Cyclops' story is drawn by the new regular penciler of Uncanny X-Men, Wills Portacio. Wills was one of the book's pencilers in the 90s before he famously jumped ship to help found Image Comics. Since then, he's drawn Wet Works, Spawn, and has returned to Marvel on books like The Hulk. I can never decide if I like his art or not. While I think he draws good bodies, I've never been a fan of his faces. I do think he draws a good Steve Rogers, but have mixed feelings on the dinosaurs and cyclops. Beast's art is drawn by Steve Sanders, who drew the Beast for the critically acclaimed but low-selling space book, Sword. I'm afraid that his Beast looks less like a Catman and more like he should be shilling cigarettes to children. Still, his Molly Hayes is a nice little cherub, full of the glee and angst that the character was famous for in Runaways. Hope's art is done by Jamie McKelvey. Jamie's primarily worked on the independent comic scene, but I do like his art. It seems like a nice cross between Steve Dillon and Kevin McGuire. There are also some little touches that I appreciate, such as Hope's hair whipping around to show that it's windy where she's sitting. Overall, I found the art to be good, but nothing spectacular. There's nothing here that you need to read. Although Hope's story is basically a prologue to the following arc in Uncanny X-Men, The Five Lights, which begins with issue 526. All three stories are written by Matt Fraction, the writer of Uncanny X-Men. The stories here are all character pieces showing the emotional development of their characters. There's no real action, aside from some dinosaur hunting, but let's let Turok be Turok, okay? The stories are nice and give you a sense of closure, especially for Cyclops and Beast as they both come to terms with their past actions and past traumas. Hope's story is one of the future as we get hints that she's going to be an important part of X-Men lore for some time, Matt Fraction does a good job of tapping into the minds of these characters, but this book is, in effect, the taking of a large breath before the next set of adventures strike. Overall, I'd say Uncanny X-Men The Heroic Age is a decent read, but I would say don't buy it unless you've just read Second Coming, in which case it feels like a very good epilogue to that story. So if you're a regular Uncanny X-Men reader, if you've just gone through Second Coming, pick it up. Otherwise, just let this one go, folks. Well, thank you for joining us. I'm the last Hangry Geek. What? Oh, um, okay, well, since this is a one-shot, uh, I guess we're done a little earlier than usual. Uh, I've got some time. Uh, are there any questions? Um, uh, yes, I have a prepared question that I would like to read at this time. Uh, go ahead. Uh, this was your 10th episode. Are you planning anything special for your 11th? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I'm pleased to announce that my next episode is my 11th, and therefore it's going to be my first ever top 11 list. Uh, and in fact, I have a very special guest lined up for a cameo appearance, and I think you're all going to like it a lot. I have a follow-up question. Uh, what is that, sir? Is there any truth to the rumor at all that you once told Joe Quesada he could get rid of the Spider-Man marriage by using Mephisto? This interview is over! And I'll just put that down to no comment.